to talk about Byram Healthcare. Byram Healthcare is a medical uh, uh, product provider or uh, medical product uh, deliverer. They were um, recently bought by Medique, which is a company out of Europe, um, France or Belgium or somewhere. Um, and um, we had started our, our uh, we had started our uh, interaction with Byram quite a few years ago. In fact, we implemented BizTalk 2006 <coughs> with them. Uh, Nick, the CIO, couldn't make it today, but uh, part of the uh, white paper that is coming out shortly, uh, he says, hey, you know, in, medic in the medical uh, uh, arena, uh, we promise that if the patient takes one phone call to us, uh, we'll take care of it. Uh, how we did that was a, uh, was a, a call center processing system. They would call in. Uh, and order information, order products, and by the time they got to the third screen, uh, they would have a response from their insurance provider saying whether they were, uh, whether they were covered or not. Uh, the, their back-end system was Informix. Raise your hand if you've heard of Informix before, okay? Raise your hand if you've used Informix, all right? Raise your hand if you've integrated with BizTalk before, okay? Uh, <laughs> So and back in 2006, there was, there was some challenges with that. Um, and, um, th and there was, uh, in order to meet Nick's uh, requirement, there was no single system uh, to communicate with Informix. Or there was no s system that could communicate from beginning to end. Informix had capabilities, but they brought in BizTalk. And so he said, uh, it, it's can, it can be a difficult system to work with. Uh, uh, in the medical insurance realm. I'm sure you guys have never heard of this before, but uh, um, what, we, what we came up with was uh, our, the Informix system, which is where the customer service reps uh, interacted with, was Informix. They had, per, they had uh, BizTalk, and because of various limitations in how the Informix was, system was set up, we had to have a data pump model, which is the SQL Server um, the middle red box, where SQL Server would communicate with Informix, and then BizTalk would then uh, communicate with SQL Server. Has anyone done something similar to this? Had problems with, with BizTalk being able to communicate with the backend system? One person? Only one. Awesome. Oh, wait a second. Okay, more than a few? All right. So this was really good uh, as we started back in 2006. Um, we, we had access to uh, our, our um, eligibility provider, which was Zermed, and they would access CMS and other, other uh, payers. However, we had a uh, two-step data pump uh, model with Informix. So, we, so BizTalk would uh, query Informix, get data, put it in SQL, and then send it off, and then BizTalk would, would actually take the data, send it off to Zermed, and then push it back to SQL, wherein SQL would push it back to uh, Informix. Um, we did this in 2006 or seven, it was a while ago, and at the volume times, uh, at the volume that they started out with, it was, it was fine, it was okay. However, as they, uh, grew, this became a larger and larger problem. Um, the number of transactions per day increased and the process became slower. Um, I could read through this, but we'd, we're running out of time, so I want to make sure uh, if you guys want to see this, this will be on the, uh, on this, on the deck soon. Um, we grew in volume and model became very inefficient. Um, and the IBM data client, which was the only client that we had at that time, uh, just couldn't handle the, uh, the, the volume. And so uh, it was becoming more and more of a problem. And, and honestly, at that time, I wasn't even aware of it. Uh, we were still working with them, but they had learned to, to live with this slowness. The impact of the, uh, uh, the business, however, was getting worse and worse. Um, as customers would call in, the customer service reps would 
would have to either wait for uh, a response or they'd have to call them back because it took too long. Um, and as such, they started losing customers. Um, Nick, Nick uh, writes that uh, uh, the data pump model that we had designed uh, just couldn't handle that volume. So again, this is, this is our, our original design. Um, I can give you my perspective, um, having worked in the integration space at Microsoft for, for some time, that if I look at this diagram, um, what occurs to me is um, not that you're using a third-party OLEDB provider from IBM. I mean, <laughs> hey, they own the database, right? And so I'm, I'm confident they have a pretty good IBM client for Informix and a, a well-thought-out OLEDB provider. Um, but it, it's how you're interacting uh, between Informix and BizTalk using this data pump, as Nick calls it. Uh, if I recall, you're using a four-part link server query, is that right? Yep. Right. So how many people have used distributed query processor in the SQL engine and four-part link server queries? Okay. Other query syntax? No? That's the thing. Most people know of only one way to use query processor with SQL server, and that's to use a four-part link server query. First part is a alias for the remote database using a connection string or a knit string in the uh, link server definition. The uh, second part is the catalog, right, the database name, if you will. Third part's the schema or the collection where the objects reside, and the last one's a table or procedure or whatever view you're interacting with. That's a really easy syntax to use. You can create that syntax and you can very easily use it against Oracle and Informix and DB2. And there's change that first part and that same query can work against SQL Server if you're migrating data or you've got the same data in all these different places. So it's really easy to use. The problem is that when you're using it, depending upon how well the OLEDB provider is implemented and whether you're using where clauses and if you're parameterizing the commands, you can actually see a lot of behavior underneath that causes significant performance, degradation, and scalability problems. Every single link server query has with it a pre-query that goes to the database and fetches column information on that command. So you've got two flows for every time you execute a statement with the four-part link server query syntax. And that in itself is, means that the data pump is half as efficient as it could be with another solution. But it works great in my development environment when, I, when they, don't have, they haven't started, they cannot tell you the volume, <laughs> what they're gonna grow to. So as well, a developer, I know, well, I know. That actually reminds me of a, a critical situation we had this week where they're using this for ad hoc queries versus using integration servers at runtime. So yeah, there's a big difference between production environments and, and, and development environments. You really wanna use the same technology in both places. But I'm, I'm the only one who's not been given business requirements or volume when we started developing solutions, right? Everyone else in the, in the audience knows volumes, where it's gonna be. What? Okay, well, shame on me uh, for not using a better. A, a yeah, better. yeah but, but in fairness too, to Eric, and of course our customer, they were gonna redesign the solution, okay? And, and one of the things you can do with link servers, you can, if you're reading from one data source and writing to another, you can use the open query syntax. And it's much more efficient, a lot quicker. But the best way to use this technology query processor, if you want the best performance, use the execute syntax. It's a pure pass-through mode. The entire statement is remoted to the database that has the data, has the views, has the optimized cache and everything, and the results come back to SQL Server. So that's the input I would have given you if you'd come to me to say, how can I redesign this current solution? But that's not what So I should have come to you earlier. Is that what I'm... No, no, no. You came to me at the right time, <laughs> but you came with me with a different question. It was about two years ago at this event. What'd you ask? So, uh, lat, not, not the previous BizTalk Summit, but the the one before, you had, what, 10 minutes to talk or something? Yeah, um, do we have more than 10 minutes this time? <laughs> <laughs> do we? Okay, all right. So he, he said, hey, uh, we're looking for Informix customers, and if you, have any if you have any, let us know. We'd like to talk with you. So literally minutes later, I went up and talked to him, and then... Uh, at, at the time, we, had, we were developing for BizTalk Server 2013 a Microsoft client for Informix that doesn't use the IBM Informix proprietary protocol. It uses an industry standard protocol. It's a protocol that Sybase and IBM and Microsoft and Oracle all support. It's called DRDA, love the four letter acronyms. But suffice it to say that there's an industry standard protocol that I can use, and I already know, I use it for DB2, I can use it everywhere that it's supported. And so I basically took, we took, our client for DB2, cloned it, modified it to work with Informix. We have a resident Informix expert here in Jorge, he used to work at IBM Informix. And then yeah, one, thing on to, one thing to note is that uh, Informix did not support for this protocol until version 11. 
So that's why it wasn't feasible before to use. The open protocol, and that's yeah, another that reason, protocol. to be fair to IBM, because they're yeah. a great group of engineers. They didn't have dirt to use at the time. And so, it's a really key point, again, to be fair with our partner, because we're an IBM partner and a, and a competitor. The, so we did an OLEDB provider, and we did a, a client on that. And yet, so what we were looking for is to actually swap that out and use it in your environment. And I think it would have matched up to your requirements at the time. I'm not sure about the quality, because it hadn't been released yet, but. So we, so but we also said that we were planning on doing, after BizTalk 13, 2013, a specific purpose BizTalk adapter for Informix. Yeah, so, so one thing led to another. We got this, this, uh, this Informix adapter for BizTalk. Uh, uh, you wanna talk a little bit about that? Or yeah, 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 yeah. So, so first of all, I'll, I'll do one more thing to, to, to get you guys to hate me. Um, Hey, we're all in the integration business, right? We're either enterprise customers, IT pros, enterprise developers, we're solution provider partners. You're working in Redmond and the integration space as software engineers. What do we do best? We take something we know and something else we know, and we use those technologies together. We combine technologies and tools to produce a solution as best we can. And that's exactly what Byram and Stott did here, a really well thought out solution. In fact, better defended by Jorge, because that's the best <laughs> you could do back then. But you know, if there is a technology um, out there, you don't know about it, that can be more specific purpose, we like to use it, right? Once we hear about it, BizTalk adapter. How many BizTalk adapters do you guys want in the world? As many as possible, right? And so we knew that there was a need for this BizTalk adapter. We committed to starting to work on it after BizTalk 2013 released. My team was late to that train by six months, it turned out. And so what happened over this period of three to six to what turned out to be 12 months before we really got re-engaged with the customers, customer satisfaction went down, Byram with Microsoft. Product satisfaction for BizTalk, if you heard about this before, went down with this customer, threatening to throw us out, and, and, and that's the right, right place, frame of mind for them to have. But no, so, one's, no one's experienced that either, right? I, it's just stock creations where the customer calls up and is, expresses frustration in BizTalk in their integration tool and says, I might as well just either pay a .NET developer or something uh, and, and do, it, do it myself, right? So three months, six months, 12 months go by. About 15 months after our first discussion with Eric and then quickly thereafter the customer, we finally had some software ready for Eric to take and start developing a solution for. And we, and then how'd that go? So the, the new solution uh, is much simpler. Uh, we've got BizTalk communicating directly to Informix. Uh, as those requests come in, as the customer service rep is on their green screen typing away as they're talking to the, uh, the customer, they press tab, they go to the next page, they enter some more information, requests go into BizTalk and immediately go to Zermed, which then communicate with CMS or United and, and other uh, payers, and that, that response comes back, goes back into the status table to say that they are eligible or not, and then all of the additional information about, about their coverage information goes to Informix. There's no data pump, uh, as Nick calls it, in, in the mix that would uh, take uh, some time away while the customer service rep was, was communicating. While, um, while or before we got uh, this new solution, during this data pump uh, process, it was taking up to 10 seconds for the customer service rep to get a response. So uh, we'll, we'll wait 10 seconds so you can understand the, the pain that the customer service reps, who, you know, as Nick said, if there's a, we are gonna be a one-stop shop, so. Well, if anyone knows me, I can't wait 10 seconds for anything, right? So, yes. but no, really, the, we had a customer sat, product sat issue here, um, but the bottom line was that the, the business was losing customers, okay? The Byram Healthcare is known for that single call, order your medical supplies, get verification of whether the government or third party is gonna, gonna cover you as an insured, and getting the order placed, and that simply wasn't happening. So it, it required greater scalability. We came to, to Microsoft. Uh, we got the, the new adapter. And here are some, here are some numbers uh, that, 
that uh, show what happened. When we first started our, our off, our old system processed 10,000 and, and more requests per day. However, when they contacted us again, it was almost double. Uh, the reason that's, that's great news for the business. We like to hear that. Yes. Right, good. Uh, everyone works for companies that double their business. Uh, the request time, it was averaging 1.87 seconds uh, on a good day, but it took up to 10 seconds occasionally. Uh, it's now down to a, a quarter of a second response time. And again, so, so well designed, well thought out, well implemented solution, but too many layers. It's just too many layers. So you go in and out of SQL Server like that, you're adding an extra transaction, you're adding extra data conversions, code page conversions in, ca in cases as well, and just a lot of authentication. Additional mapping. moving parts. Yeah. Additional, and it was something that required them to reboot the machine on a regular basis because connections would fail or it becomes stale. And so uh, uh, they had, they re we reduced the requests per second. Um, and they also have a nightly batch process. So maybe the, the, the payer can't, doesn't respond or uh, you know, they need additional information. So they had this nightly batch process that runs um, that would kick off at five in the morning. Everyone, everyone deals with, with a, batch, a nightly batch process? Yes? This batch process would start at five in the morning. Now, uh, it, you, it eventually took five and a half hours for the batch process to finish before customer service reps can get on the phone. So a little bit of math, if you start at five in the morning, it's 10.30 before the customer service reps can actually start taking calls. So this became prime time for, uh, for business to be impacted. If I get sick over the, in the evening, the first thing I'm gonna do at 8 a.m. or whenever the, the phones open up is I'm gonna call an order. Well, if, if my customer service reps can't actually start work until 10.30, that becomes a real problem. So um, with this new design, we eliminated, almost eliminated all of the, the problems that they have, have experienced. Um, our, the business logic is more tightly coupled with the biz talks, with, with how the business runs. There's fewer moving parts. And uh, the simplicity makes it really easy to understand where the problem is. When we first started and throughout the, the troubleshooting efforts required on the original system, we had to be an expert in not only Informix and BizTalk, but we also had to be, uh, look in SQL. And this became a real challenge. Um, Nick, Nick says that uh, all the work that happened in, in, in SQL is now happening in BizTalk, and it works be far better than the data pump model. The biggest takeaway, however, is not the, is not the technology. It is the fact that, that um, Microsoft came through, and, and um, he says this solution can meet our needs now and for the foreseeable future. We're able to keep up with, with, the, uh, with the, the growing business. Well, on behalf of Guru Mark and I, for us, it's we retain the customer. That's the absolute most important thing. Well, at the end, we'll, we'll talk about some other takeaways from all, all three of our orgs. Cool, clicker, nice. Right, so I just want to clarify a few things before we get to the Q&A. Uh, this is a little topo diagram. On the right side would be the IBM system in this case. On the left side would be the Microsoft system that's running the BizTalk adapter, Windows. Currently, the lower left scores is what we offer. We offer an OLED provider and a Dirta client for Informix. All Microsoft design and develop, develop code. It's in our 2013 release. HIS is an acronym for host integration server. It's supplemental to BizTalk. Happens to be on a separate CD. It's effectively the same product. Sometimes it ships a little out of sync with the, the major and minor BizTalk releases. Uh, if you want to use that OLED provider, you can do it now. But to be honest, we've it, we've improved that so much while wor working with Byram and Stott that if you want to use the current OLED provider that's out there already, send me a note. We'll give you the newer one, okay? It's, we'll, we'll work that out through rapid deployment or, or some other mechanism. The right side of that left diagram, the bottom blocks, are what we're adding in our next release, our HSV next for this BizTalk server release that Bill talked about being mid this coming year. And that's where we have the BizTalk adapter. It runs on top of a Microsoft. .NET Framework data provider for Informix. Again, our team 
same, same building as Bill Staples and the rest of the AppPlot team, uh, building 44, <coughs> on top of our improved Dirta client. And we'll talk a little bit about how we improved it in a minute. On the right side, as Jorge mentioned, you need a later version of Informix, version 11.7 or later. You need to enable the DRDA server listener. It's not always enabled. And then you also have things, you know, firewalls and that sort of stuff you have to consider as well, okay? So it's not like you just connect the client up and it's just gonna work. A lot of customers we work with, again, raise your hands if you're an org or you're a solution provider, don't, still don't do any remote data access. I mean, I encounter that every, every now and then, every few months. It's amazing, really. Everything's done on the back end or using file transfer or something like that. So it's just, it's not plug and play, but um, we have pretty good documentation, which also was improved by working with Eric's team and uh, we're there to, to back up. So what I'm gonna show you is basically three, three of the top features that Eric and Stud Creations were using during this process. Uh, some of these features I'm gonna mention is they have been influenced by the feedback that Eric provided. He provided like some, some uh, case, some scenarios that we didn't initially support, but they were like good feedback, so we implemented them because we know it's gonna help lots of customers, not just Byram. So without further ado, I'm gonna give you a demo. Uh, so the first feature I'm gonna show is the receive locations. Uh, one little known feature of our adapter, and this is also not restricted to our adapter for Informix, it's also in our adapter for DB2, is the ability to configure a receive location with uh, a SQL command that's gonna be like a polling for uh, however, like in this case for 30 seconds, it's gonna be polling every 30 seconds, see if this uh, statement returns any rows. But uh, it can work with an update command, in this case a uh, delete, where it can be a cursor update. So this is a little known feature of our adapter that's like proven very useful for Eric and Sot creations because they need to like poll information and update the rows at the same time. Okay, so I'm gonna go on just for a small demo. I configured this port to call a store procedure. This store procedure basically is like generating new data, and then I'm deleting that data and polling for more information. So it's a continuous poll just to show how it how it works. So all I have to do is in start this application. Make sure start polling. I'm gonna see a file here. Here we have the file. Uh, I can open it with just to show you what it looks like. And in 30 seconds, we have another file. So here's what it looks like. It like basically retrieving all these rows like every set amount of time. And it deletes them and I get some new rows. Like the next time I'm gonna get some different rows. Because I'm polling the information. I can update it, I can delete it. It's like really useful stuff. So. So this is important because it's often used for, for bulk data reading, right? And we like to think that within our team, because we've been doing cross-platform integration for decades, um, and you've got different encoding of the data, different formatting of the data, that we do data decoding and encoding really, really efficiently, and, and I think we do. Um, there is a way to speed that up as well if you're reading bulk data out of Informix, out of DB2 with our technologies, and we have a concurrent processing option when we're fetching data that you can turn on, just a tip for you. Call it Rosette Cache, not sure why. Well, I know it's from OLEDB, but we kept the same name even, even at the biztalk and .NET layer. It's something you, you configure in the connection string, and you can fiddle with the values to kind of get an optimum fetch. Because if you don't, what happens normally um, in remote data access is when you connect to the database, you're processing protocol queries on the wire. Meanwhile, the consumer, biztalk or SQL or whatever, is waiting for that wire level protocol to get processed. Then the database is processing the request. Then response come back on the wire. Then the data provider or driver or whatever, BizTalk Adapt in this case, processes a rows to get back to the consumer, BizTalk Server in this case. And if you looked at the performance metrics of your running machine, you could see the network and the CPU, and the CPU would be up, then it would go down to nothing, the network would be up. You'd see this, you know, this, this, this cadence where Nothing's being done at the same time. And what we did is we implemented a, a technology to do multiple concurrent processing on fetching data. So if you're bringing lots of rows of data back, make sure you check for that little option in the connection string. You turn it on, you can tune it a little bit. And what it'll do is concurrent processing. We'll use the network to the best we can. We'll use the CPU to the best we can. We'll use multiple cores. Just how, tip. how much performance improvement have you seen? It really depends upon the data itself. The actual columns and the data types and how many, 
what, what the single row of data looks like that's coming back is gonna be the same in every case, whether there's null data and stuff like that in there. So it could be anywhere from 5X to 20X performance, it really depends. That also works inside integration services and uh, custom consumers as well, uh, as well as our BizTalk adapter. Okay, so the second demo I wanna show is uh, one also little known feature of our send ports that this same thing, this uh, feature is both in our DB2 and Informix adapters. And in this case, it's a usable copy feature. So I have two ports here, these are two send ports configured here. One of them has a uh, usable copy false. And then I have another one that says usable copy true. Now I can do like the typical BStock demo where I'm copying the file into a folder and then I wait for the folder to what I created, that's very boring, so I created an app for that. It's a small application that'll do that, all that for me. It's gonna put a file in the folder. In this case, I'm sending 10,000 records. The records look like these. It's a customer database. So I'm inserting these 10,000 customers and I'm gonna compare what it looks like with, without the bull copy, when I set the bull copy to false, and when I use it to true, just to see what the performance improvement is. So I'm gonna start my little application. And at first, it, the first thing you see is it deletes the rows and then it's using non-bulk copy and inserting 10,000 rows. We have to wait for a few seconds. About as long as the uh, customer service reps had to wait on the phone? Yeah, <laughs> kind of. In this case, it was 9.6 seconds, and as you can see, the XML output, for every row that was affected, it shows me like a rows affected line, because it was performed row by row. I have a breakpoint here in my application, but now I'm gonna continue to run the bulk copy version of these. And in this case, you're gonna see it's fast, 1.4 seconds. So this is like a huge improvement compared 9.6 seconds to 1.4 seconds. And I only get one single row in my results saying I affected 10,000 rows. So this is like really a major improvement. It's also available, as I said, in our DB2 adapter. So, I mean, this was also very useful for start creations during this engagement because they got like much better performance when inserting data into. So the, the concurrent fetching, call it reset cache, and then the bulk copy, bulk insert, we were never gonna deliver that ever until customers came to us and asked us, so look, we have a performance problem, we looked at it, tried to figure out ways to optimize our buffers, we're doing conversions and encodings I mentioned before, and it came down to just coming up with new technology or taking existing technology, bulk copy, that you find in the SQL Server world, and mapping it to OLEDB, IROSET, FastLoad, and .NET bulk copy. Inside BizTalk, we also call it bulk insert. It's the difference between you know, inserting all the columns or inserting selected columns. Mm -hmm. The third feature I wanna show today is a feature that was actually inspired by this customer. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, we call it the custom SQL statements. I'm gonna show it in Visual Studio. Here I'm gonna call our adapter to generate some uh, schemas. I select our Informix adapter. I select one of my existing ports. This one, okay, so it has my paper, populates my connection string. I can, I put the request and response. And then this is a new feature, the custom SQL statement. So what's a custom SQL statement? It's basically any statement you want. So Byram came to us and they sort of like, oh well, we need to insert data into this, or select data from this table, but we need to use this keyword today. Or maybe like a complex thing like to, to, today minus 10 days units day. There was no way in our current implementation of the adapter to support this kind of syntax in a SQL query. So they mean they and they wanted to use the database date, not like the .NET date. Okay. And so what we came up with was these custom statements. These are parameterized statements. And here I can mix like fixed values. I can mix like these kind of constants that are database constants. And I can mix parameters. So when I plug into this into the schema creator. I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna paste my statement, I just do next, and it's gonna generate a schema for me. This schema is gonna have the statement, because it's a fixed statement, now I can only use this schema for this particular statement, but it's gonna let me use, like the parameters I specified with question marks are parameters that I can send when I'm calling these, when I'm using this send port, and so it's very flexible. I can do like whatever I want. I can use any statement I want. It doesn't have to be like one of the set statements that I have to use. Like it doesn't have to be an insert, uh, an update gram, whatever. I can use whatever statement. 
Another feature that we added, which is, I mean, is a minor, well, not minor feature, but it's a good one. It's uh, in the select statements before we return on any type. Now we're returning like exactly what we're expecting. So this is it's returning the table that we're expecting or the results that we're expecting. We're returning uh, like with all the information about the columns. This is very useful for mapping. If I'm mapping this result in, a, in an orchestration, this is very useful. So we are listening to you out there that already use our BizTalk adapter for DB2. And we're factoring that feedback in as we improve the Informix adapter, primarily for, for Stott right now, I mean Byram, uh, Stott on side of Byram, but also for other Informix customers. We're also revving our DB2 adapter for our next release, adding this function, like making them common but, but much improved. Mm -hmm. And this is what a is, um, instance of this XML would look like. So basically, I have my statement and I send only the parameters that I need. Like here, I'm affecting more columns because I'm setting this view to this literal, but I can parameterize this part of the statement. And that's basically it for my demos. Think of this as what we're offering in the 2015 release because it's, it's mostly that, like the transactions is new, it wasn't there before. Um, most of the new data types we've had to add for stock weren't there in the current OADB. So again, come and ask me if you wanna use OADB. Um, the, the current provider doesn't meet your needs, uh, we'll, we'll work out a solution for you. Uh, again, a little bit of gratuitous marketing. Our team, as I mentioned before, does everything IBM. If you look at the right side, it's uh, any IBM system of record, like a mainframe, as well as those, those platforms that they love so much in the Linux world. Um, it's their transaction systems like Kix. It's their relational databases. We mentioned those. Their file system, record-oriented files. You can access those. Their security system. We're the team that, enter that develops enterprise single sign-ons. We've got password sync uh, options as well. Um, credential mapping, certainly. We have some customers that do credential mapping up to 20,000 rack FIDs a day. So it's a very well used in certain um, environments. And then also webs for MQ, messaging. We like to do everything as that right line shows based on the wire protocols. We get more control, we can do a better job, we can keep IBM on their platform, we can remain on ours without their footprint. Except one, one area we can't do that, and that's webs for MQ. I'll talk about that here in a moment. But uh, first, we want to give you a demo of what we're looking at doing, being a Mobile-first, cloud-first company. Of course, we're developing microservices. We want to give you a demo of our DB2 microservice that Jorge is working on right now. Okay, so switching to the more modern stuff. Now I'm going to talk about the microservice. Uh, our microservice, I mean, it's not very sexy to demonstrate a REST API, which is basically what a microservice is. So what I'm going to, what I have here is the, a local run of a microservice, like an on-premise execution of a microservice, and I'm showing the different operations that we support. Like, I mean, this is by no way a final list. This is a pre in pre-alpha state at the moment. Uh, so, but these are like a few of the operations we can see. So the way we're foreseeing to communicate to the DB2 via these microservices is using these kind of like verbs, like using a select statement, and I just provide the table name. In this case, I'm gonna use this table and just say, return me the, so I send a request and I get a bunch of rows. All our adapter or our new microservice is uh, completely JSON. And it's not like uh, wrapping our current uh, BizTalk adapter. This is a brand new implementation based solely on JSON. And we're doing that mainly for, again, scale and performance, mm -hmm. right? Simplicity, easier to engineer, much better to, to provide a, a support solution because there's fewer layers in there. That does mean there's an opportunity for our partners to migrate from current XML-based BizTalk solutions to the microservices, whether the microservices are running on-prem or in, in Azure, of course. This implementation is also based on our brand new managed, fully managed DRDA uh, provider. Uh, so this, the whole stack is gonna be like fully managed, no more like a C++ code running Again, no thunking in and out of managed code. We get about 30% improvement in performance in each direction. That's significant. So we're, we're pretty much going to manage everywhere we can, except for in our core SNA gateway and, and terminal. Well, we have a terminal node that's all managed as well. So, I mean, this was the first demo for the select statement. I also like to use this other tool called Postman for testing my, micro, my Microsoft site development. In this case, I can do like a delete. 
And this is a very handy tool. I just say send, and it'll delete the rows. It gives me a response. Then I do a select. And right now it's like an empty. And I can do an insert. Like for an insert, what I do is like just provide a bunch of rows. Once again, this is a JSON format for the rows. I just say uh, send. It tells me that it affected the rows, and I can do a select again. Send the select, and it returns me the rows. So pretty simple, pretty straightforward. We want this to be optimized for performance and ease of use. Mm -hmm. And we're, I mean, we're still in the stages of developing this. So we're taking, like, if you have any advice, any, like, feedback on how, what kind of operations you would like to be supported with this microservice, what kind of things you need to connect to. On the yeah, absolutely. Side. So, so many of you know one of our friends back. and partners, John Fancy, and he's already on the list, but we're entertaining more of, of you to join us in design review of this technology. There's no standard for SQL over JSON. There's a couple of companies that have commercial implementations, but there's no industry standard out there yet. And it looks like we're going to be, you know, on the bleeding edge there. So we want your feedback. How can we make this intuitive, easy to use, but yet functional? Remember that custom SQL, as much power as possible at, at given times. Um, so we think the customer evidence, Byram Healthcare's solution, working with Stop and Microsoft is compelling. And yet, you know, working with Jorge to get involved with us, you can learn all, all about these new web tools because microservices may be new to you. Maybe that's value add as well. So uh, last uh, gratuitous slide from marketing perspective, our integration roadmap. Microservices, we're planning to deliver these microservices. Kix IMS I programs, that's the AS400 reference and Bill Staples deck goes by different names nowadays. Um, that's our transaction integrator technology. So we've already prototyped transaction integrator going outbound um, from Azure, but this is implementing it as a, as a set of microservices. We also have transaction integrator where the foreign transaction program can call into Windows and access any Windows or Azure solution. Again, we prototype that as an Azure web application as well. Not certain whether that makes sense to convert that into Microsoft, but, but outbound from Azure, outbound from Windows, because these can run on both on-prem and in the cloud, uh, makes sense with our Kix IMS AS Runner program, if you will. DB2 Informix using our new managed Durga client. And then also WebServe MQ, probably the most popular IBM connector in the BizTalk world today is MQ, that's what I'm told. 20% um, of customers use it, very high, high usage scenario, and so, Rather than wait around for IBM, they're a great partner for us, we're actually implementing a microservice for WebStream MQ that's based on a Microsoft client for WebStream MQ, a Microsoft protocol client for MQ. So, so you're saying that I don't have to install an IBM client on my Windows machine anymore? Right, I think IBM, obviously they know these technologies and they implement the protocols, they make them part of the industry standards, we work with them as well in the industry standard groups. So they obviously know how to implement their protocols. But frankly, you know, they focus on Java, right? And I know we're supporting Java and Azure as well, but our team, we focus on .NET. As I mentioned before, we're trying to take all of our component technologies and tools and move to .NET. So we have a nice, easy to implement, engineer support, much simpler, better robustness, scale, performance, all of those things. And so, frankly, I don't want to wait. I think we can do a good job. I don't want to have to try to find the, the, the uh, download from, from the site to try to download the client when I have to connect to MQ. It's good feedback, we appreciate that. Um, also Power BI and SQL Server. We, today we put our DB2 client and provider in the box. We're working on a larger package of technologies, ODBC, ODB, ADO.net, and BizTalk, putting into a package that makes it a little more portable for you during pre-release and probably also in post-release. Certainly we plan to deliver both DB2 and Formix for use by SQL licensed customers, just extending what we do for DB2 today, and also for Power BI. Again, what we extend what we do for DB2 today. If you're an Excel Power BI user using Power BI in the cloud, using the, uh, the data factory in, in Azure, you'll have direct connectivity to DB2 and Informix. And then lastly, our, our VNEX for on-prem. Uh, highlights there, just to name a couple, our improvements for Informix, the new BizTalk adapter and .NET provider, and this new managed Dirt client that commonly works for DB2 and Informix. There we're offering a new ADO.NET provider. We'll keep the old ones, but this is a, and the one, the line above, but this is a new one that supports asynchronous programming and a lot of new capabilities. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, Byram is happy uh, again. We, 
we, uh, Byram and Stock Creations, learned a ton on, on the uh, Informix adapter. Um, we were able to rewrite the, the solution, simplifying it. And honestly, for us, it took about four hours. I mean, there was a, there was a bunch of chatter back and forth with Jorge and, and Paul during the design. We would, we would develop something, and because of some limitations in the adapter, we would, we would design something. And literally, the next week, we'd have a solution uh, that would fix the problem. So we'd have to go rev it again. But it was great, because it made our process really, really, really streamlined. But it was, it was not um, in any way because of us. It was because of our communication with the host integration team and their responsiveness to what we asked for and said, hey, this is the requirements. We'll go and code, code this solution uh, to do updates. And then they'd come back and say, well, we added this cursor uh, so you can go in and change it, which was awesome. Uh, yeah, so, so I think the, the key takeaways is, you know, we, we saved a customer. They got early access to industry, you know, technology that they wouldn't have had otherwise. That's our model in our team. Our team is, <laughs> the team, I haven't been there that long. The team's been around for like 30 years, and they started with OS2-based ATMs at Microsoft. And they're, they're known for having fixes to customer problems before the, the support case can get escalated into Redmond, right? But we're all about working with a set of customers. And, you know, frankly, it's because we started with mainframe, and, you know, there's, there's not that many mainframes out there, relatively speaking, right? So we're talking about thousands of customers, Microsoft's biggest customers. As we get into DB2 and Informix and MQ, we broaden out to the middle tier and, you know, higher volume. But our model remains the same. We like direct customer contact or through our partners, through consulting services. We oftentimes get involved in support cases, again, very early on. And, you know, you can get to us pretty easily. You'll, you'll get our email here in a second. And we like that because... We get early feedback on technology during pre-release. We get ongoing feedback after and post-release. And frankly, you push us to operate at, at cloud speed, even though we're developing on-premises technology, which is where, what our customers want today. Because all these systems run on-prem. Now, you can run DB2 and MQ in the cloud, of course.